Hello, Rello. F- what am I saying? Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. <laughs> what is going on? Hopefully you're having a fantastic day. I want to dive into China because they are having some deflationary problems. And we've got to step back and ask ourselves, how could this impact the United States? Or maybe a better question would be, if your base case, given the data that we're going to go over here in just a moment, is that China is going to go into more disinflation and potentially deflation, could that potentially change your base case for what we might expect in the United States as far as deflation, disinflation, or inflation throughout the rest of 2024 going into 2025. Let's go right over to an article from Wall Street Journal. And although the title doesn't really, uh, the the title of the article isn't really where I want to go with it, but it does give us some anecdotal evidence as to the deflationary problems they're having. So, and it is quite startling from a standpoint of Big Brother, the CBDC, the Orwellian stuff we talk about on this channel all the time. China's punishment for people with bad debts, no fast trains or nice hotels. Beijing's crackdown on millions of delinquent debtors makes catching up on unpaid bills a slog, right? But just, so let's just, you know, one of the main reasons I started this channel, and you guys know this well, is to really push back against the mandates. Uh, In fact, I just last night, I was uh, emailing back and forth uh, RFK, and I I told him that uh, one thing I'll remember for the rest of my life is standing in the freezing cold in Washington, D.C. In fact, Josh was there, and Angelique was there as well, and uh, listening to RFK speak. And I said it was one of the coldest I've ever been. I was miserable, (laughs) but I loved every single minute of it. I said your speech was just incredibly inspirational. But one of the reasons I started this channel was to push back on those mandates. And it wasn't just, oh, well... This is bad because of what's happening right now. That that was absolutely true. This is bad because we shouldn't allow some people to go to a restaurant and other people not. And this takes us straight back to Jim Crow. But one of my main arguments was this sets a precedent for this becoming more and more and more extreme in the future. It's like it normalizes it. And then you're just slowly boiling the frog. So, you know, would we have something like this in the United States? Probably not for debts. But I can assure you now that in some states, they've normalized the idea of having to show your papers before you go into a restaurant or having to wear like a yellow star, uh, which again is taking us straight back to Jim Crow and you could argue, taking you back to some of the things that they did in Germany in 1930, in the 1930s. But uh, I think what it's doing, really, is putting you on the fast track (laughs) to the road to serfdom, right? So in China, as an example, they're kind of, they've already normalized this to where people really aren't pushing back on it too much as insane as that sounds, but in the United States, since we've normalized it through the government policies, through the Cervasa sickness, you know, when we get the next round of crisis, whatever it may be, I think a lot of people in those blue states are going to be much more receptive to these types of draconian measures. Maybe not around debt, but around other things that are perceived to be socially unacceptable. Let's get back to the article here and focus more on the economics. I I wanted to point this out, is why I highlighted it. On the aging slow train, so this, uh, they're talking about this gal who didn't pay her debt 
and now she can't ride the fast train, so she has to ride the slow train. <laughs> And it says on the aging slow trains she is left to ride. Ken sometimes looks at the other passengers and thinks, I wonder if they're all bad debtors like me. <laughs> and the reason this cracks me up is because the last time I was in St. Bart's, I was uh, at lunch with Steve and his wife. And when I'm in St. Bart's, I always drive this little electric vehicle called a Twizy. It's, uh, I won't take the time to show it to you, but Google it when we get done with the live stream. And I think you'll get a kick out of it because it's a little teeny weeny thing. In fact, it's, it's considered uh, an electric bicycle, actually a quadricycle. And it's just the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. I'm sure they're illegal in the United States, but I always drive one of these things because it's so easy to park because you can park it on the sidewalks. You can park it in the motorcycle spaces, whatever. And so they, they, we're, we were talking about the Twizy at lunch, <clears throat> and they said, do people look at you weird when you drive that thing around? I'm like, I, I guess. I, I probably look like a complete tool driving it. <laughs> I'll admit that. And they're like, no, 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 no. You, you, you're not following what we're saying. And I'm like, yeah, okay, explain. And they said the only adults that actually drive those Twizzies on the island of St. Bart's are people that have had a DUI. Uh, because you can actually drive one of those things without a license because they allow uh, people to drive them uh, by the t uh, at, at 14. So you don't have a license. They let 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds drive them. And therefore, if you've got a DUI, you can. that's like the only type of car or vehicle you can rent. So if you've got an adult driving one, everyone just assumes that you're doing so because you were drinking and driving. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just this, when I was reading this about Ken, Quinn or whatever, looking around the uh, the other train and thinking, I wonder if these passengers are bad debtors too. The next time I go to St. Bart's, which is going to be next week, every single time I see an adult driving a Twizy, now that's what I'm going to be thinking. I wonder if those guys have a DUI. Anyway, getting back to the article. So we can see this chart of Chinese household debt just absolutely exploding until we get to the sur Cervasa sickness, and now it's leveled up. And it's actually not the Cervasa sickness, you'll notice. It was really January 2022, and it starts to flatten out, and that's when they really started to have their problems with the real estate market. If I'm not mistaken, that's when Evergrande really first hit the news. So household debt has surged by 50% in the past five years to around $11 trillion today. While it's lower than the $17 trillion Americans owe, it is a huge sum in a country where people earn far less. Yeah, it is. I can see where they're going with that. But at the end of the day, I think it also has a lot to do with disposable income. So as an example, let's say you're an American and you're making $5,000 a month. Okay, well, if your expenses are $6,000, then that debt burden is going to be even greater for you than it is for a Chinese person that might be making $3,000, but yet at the end of the month, they've got savings, or they've got something left over, they're not in, in the hole, because the other payments that they have outside of their debt payments are a lot lower. Just throwing that out there, food for thought. With home prices falling, and here's when we get into something that we can all relate to, going through the GFC, which is what we have to factor into the equation when we're trying to think about the probabilities of China going through a similar deflationary bust. With home prices falling, deflation risks become entrenched. And unemployment a persistent challenge. Chinese leaders are eager to get people spending more. Uh, it, 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 then you go into the, the madness of mainstream economics. But each additional dollar going to pay for debt is taking away one that could be used to splurge, splurge, or just buy new clothes or pay for a vacation. So now this really starts to hit home based on what we're experiencing in the United States. Because we're seeing, 
excuse me, we're seeing oil prices go higher and higher and higher, which most people think, well, this is inflationary. And to a certain degree, I would, uh, I think they've got a good point. But if the money supply growth is not increasing, if we have lower velocity, if the banks aren't lending, if they're looking out in the economy and saying, no, 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 there's just too much risk out there. If you have a, a decrease in bank credit, I think it's very difficult to have sustained consumer price inflation, especially if velocity is slowing or velocity is slow to begin with because of this dynamic, right? So here in the United States, it might not be the fact that our, our debt is so wildly overwhelming, which I think for most people it probably is. But even aside from that, what you have is all these other expenses that you have to pay for. It's the stuff you need versus the stuff you want. So if you're out there spending every single last dime on filling up your car or paying for food, then even though it might not be paying down debt, the net result is still the same. And then that result I'm talking about is spending less on clothing, vacation, or just spending less on the things that you want. So on net balance, are we having consumer prices go up or down or stay flat? These are the things that I think we should consider. With so many Chinese consumers under financial pressure, Western companies, including Apple, Estee Lauder, and General Motors have reported weaker sales in China. This goes right back to what we were talking about. China's long housing boom was a significant cause for the rise in personal debts. Sound familiar? Because many people had to borrow more to afford homes. Some buyers took an extra debt to buy more properties for investment purposes. Sometimes letting them sit empty. Well, thank goodness we don't do that here in the United States. Uh, so what you have to start asking yourself is, is, wait a minute here. If I'm leaning towards China's problems causing a deflationary bust and they're doing the exact same things we're doing in the United States, hmm, maybe inflation isn't so inevitable as far as consumer price inflation here. And maybe inflation never goes up in a straight line. It's always a big roller coaster ride. And maybe the roller coaster ride is going to look a lot more like the 1940s than the 1970s. Let's get back to this. And I've got several charts. We're going to go over the PBOC's balance sheet. We're going to compare that to the Fed. I think you guys are going to really get a kick out of the rest of this video. Now that the boom is over and prices are falling, many are stuck with debts they can't handle. The number of foreclosed homes listed for sale rose 43% in 2023. I mean, they're going through exactly what we went through in the United States during the GFC. Exactly. So then you've got to ask yourself, okay, well... That was, you could argue, that was a U.S.-centric problem that caused the a collateral shortage in an already extremely fragile monetary system, which created a global financial crisis. I, I think that's the most realistic. Uh, I, I think that would be... Now that we can look back, hindsight being 2020, I think that is my base case for sure as far as kind of the step-by-step -step process that created what we saw in 2008 and 2009. But let's think about this. Uh, it is true that the, uh, the Chinese banks aren't as systemic, let's say, as the United States banks were to the global economy. But... You have to ask yourself how much of this lending for the real estate is coming from the Chinese banks and how much is it coming from the euro dollar system. And if it's coming from the euro dollar system, then these debt defaults 
will not just impact the Chinese banks to where the PBOC can step in and bail them out, but it's impacting all of these banks that are outside the purview of the PBOC. And oh, by the way, the Federal Reserve. And that increases perceived risk. If that increases perceived risk in the banking system, what do the banks do? They pull the reins. They tighten things up. You see bank credit go down. And if you see bank credit go down to an even uh, more, to an even greater degree than what we've seen, then this could cause some of the same deflationary impacts right here in the United States. Let's get back to the article. The increase in personal debts is also partly a result of more people using credit cards and tapping personal credit lines to handle expenses as the economy stagnates. I mean, you know, if I wouldn't have told you this article was about China and I would have just started off without that headline, you would have easily come to the conclusion that this was about the United States. Let's get back to it here. Many economists say U.S. style financial crisis is unlikely in China soon. State control banking system means the government can absorb losses and inject capital in an emergency. And we just discussed that. Sure. So you can bail out the Chinese banks, but this doesn't mean that the Chinese banks or that the euro dollar banks don't have exposure to this type of real estate bust or this deflationary bust in China which I can assure you they do. And if they have exposure to this, then they're going to be willing to lend a lot less. They're going to increase lending standards. And oh, by the way, then what happens to the demand for collateral? I don't want to go off on a completely separate tangent, but then that increases the demand for collateral at the same time when there's less willingness to rehypothecate. Which if you guys watch my videos, you, you kind of know what I'm saying there. You're connecting those dots. But for those of you who don't, the long story short is that creates an environment where the global banks are even more risk off than they otherwise would be, which will inevitably bleed into the United States. Now, to be fair, that's a cross current, right? It doesn't mean that just because the euro dollar banks are risk off that all of a sudden we're going to have a deflationary collapse or bust in the United States. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that's a major cross current that is going to impact the other variables that we have in the United States that we have to consider. It's bank talking about China. It's banks issued tens of millions of new credit cards last year without with outstanding balances jumping 50% between 2018 and 2023 to well over 1 trillion. Josh, where else is credit card debt exploding to the point where it's over $1 trillion? I think the US of A. Oh, that would be right, the US of A. <laughs> Private technology apps such as Alipay and WeChat also started helping consumers secure loans as their digital payment system soured in popularity or soared in popularity soured uh, as their digital payment system soared in popularity and what this reminded me of is all of the the rage right now in the united states with the buy now pay later in fact we did a story the other day on how they're now doing buy now pay later with rent with apartment rents in fact talking to kenny about this he said what was it josh 12 like 16 percent of his tenants right now, and he's got over 100,000 doors. Over It was like 12 or 16% of his tenants right now are using this buy now, pay later to pay their rent every single month. Josh, do you remember if it was 12 or 16%? I know it was one of those. It was between 12 and 16, but it's not 100,000. It was 10,000. Oh, he's got 10,000 doors? 10,000 apartments, yeah. Oh, well... Tell, tell me he needs to step up his game. What's he doing with his, these measly 10,000 apartment units? My goodness gracious. I thought he was a player. I got to get... <laughs> Come on, Kenny. You can do better than that. Anyway. <laughs> but when debts go unpaid, a person's income can be seized. 
by the state to cover their liabilities, leaving debtors with small allowance to scrape by. And the reason I highlighted this is because even if the, the government isn't seizing your assets or seizing your income, it, it's still, the, the net result is very similar. From the overwhelming, you're having to pay these debts and therefore you have a smaller amount to pay other people. Or in, this, in the case of the United States, it could be debts or it could be oil prices. It could be the cost of rent. It could be the cost of food. Net result is the same. And then they go, they talk about uh, another personal story from this gal. And now I want to get into one of the biggest economic fallacies in modern day economics uh without a doubt in fact i think we can give this the title of the most idiotic <laughs> economic theory in our lifetime this is the stupidest idea i have ever heard and it's just said over and over and over again even when i didn't know the first thing even back in 2012 when I didn't know what the Fed was, I didn't know the yield curve, I barely knew what interest rates were. Even back then, when I first started to hear this idea uh, pushed by mainstream economists, I'm like, what? That, that doesn't make any sense at all. But you just hear it over and over and over. So I wanna go over this briefly, and then we're gonna get into some of the charts comparing China and the United States. Oh, and we're got ah, forget it. I forgot, Josh, we're going to have to switch up the screen share to do that, right? So you can hear the audio. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. The bottom line here, guys, is what they're talking about in this little video clip from the Wall Street Journal is how this means just complete doom for China because once you get that first whiff of consumer price deflation, then it's just this doom loop all the way down because they say that consumers won't buy anything. That's the argument that I was referring to that is completely retarded. These consumers, they, oh, well, if they think that prices are going to be one penny lower next year, then they're not going to buy anything. And then the economy just freezes, just like it did during the Cervasa sickness or something like that. But think for a moment. Number one, do people buy cars? Do people buy new cars? Why? Why on earth would, in fact, why would you buy a car, period? Even if you buy a used car, I can almost guarantee it's going to be worth less next year, or you could have bought it cheaper next year. How about technology? How about a phone? How about a computer? How about this camera? How about lights? How about, <laughs> how about pretty much anything you buy? is going to be less expensive if you buy it next year. Why would people use credit cards? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're doing the exact same thing by paying the interest on the credit card, meaning that you are willing to pay uh, more to get it right now. Right? You're willing to pay more money when you could just wait into the future and get it at a cheaper price to where you wouldn't have to pay that interest rate. Right? Name one thing, one thing that people buy other than financial assets. So maybe if you're out there looking for a house and you think that prices are going down, you say, okay, I'm, maybe I'll wait till next year. I'll just rent. Okay, I get that argument. But everything else, gas, I mean, think about, oh, honey, I've got to put gas in the car. Okay, well, why don't you go down to the local uh, shell station? and go nuts. Oh, 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 I can't do that. No, 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 no. With this inverted yield curve, gas is going to be way cheaper next year. So we'll go ahead and, and, and keep the four by four parked in the garage. I mean, come on. How about food? Boy, I'm starving. I am famished, but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and hold off uh, to eat until next week, because I think the price of lettuce might be a little lower. This is just insanity. So I just wanted to go off on that quick rant here quickly before we get back into the important part <laughs> of the video. All right, now let's go over some charts here. And the reason I'm pulling up these charts 
is because, again, if you're number one, we have to understand that what is happening in China is absolutely going to impact the United States. It's just a matter of to what degree based on the other variables, because this is just one of thousands of cross currents. But number two, if your base case is, yes, the probability is very high, China is going into a deflationary bust, but your base case for the United States is that we're in reflation and that we have just entered this next wave of consumer price inflation where we're going right back to the 1970s. In fact, we're, in fact, we're going to blow by the 9% that we saw in June or July of 2022 and we're going to 12, 15, 20, 25%. I mean, we're going straight into to hyperinflation. Now, that's a lot of people's view, right? But I, I think those, you can't really reconcile those two. And here's what I'm talking about. Let's start by looking at the debt to GDP. Because if, someone, if, there, if someone's base case is that we are going straight into uh, reflation and the 1970s and we're at 3.5, but next month we're going to five and the next month after that it's going to be six, it's going to be nine, it's going to be 10, it's going to be 12, et cetera. Then one of the arguments they always give you is that the debt to GDP has exploded and debt overall, right? But we see that debt to GDP was about 105 in 2019 and now it's about 121, which isn't good. I mean, I agree, definitely exploding higher. But now let's compare that with China. And that it is true that China's overall debt to GDP is lower. But at the end of the day, not by much. I mean, China is still clocking in, and this is old. They're clocking in over 80% right now. But look at the percentage increase. They went from 60 up to 20, which in terms of a of an overall percentage increase is higher. They went up by 20%, where we went up by, what, let's just call it 15%, roughly. Um, and then the percentage increase, based on what you started with, obviously, was, was way higher. Because uh, a 20% increase on 60%, what's that, a 30% increase, basically? Right. So you could argue that China's increase in debt to GDP was much more significant in terms of inflation, deflation, disinflation. OK, now let's go over to the overall debt, because this is another argument that you get for, uh, you know, this reflationary cycle that we're heading into, if that's someone's base case. So we start here with 2019, we're 23 trillion. Now we're up to 34 trillion, over 34 trillion. A, a staggering increase of, of, let's just call it 50%. But let's go over to China. And we can see that their increase was not 50%, but almost 100%. All right, now let's look at M2 money supply. The government's printing money, the Fed's printing money, printing money, printing money. Look at all this increase in the money supply. And this is gonna be wildly inflationary. Even though the money supply has gone down dramatically as measured by M2 since then, it just doesn't matter because there's so many currency units, so many more currency units that are circulating that the 1970s is just inevitable, regardless of what's happened over the last year or two. Okay, that's a fair argument. Let's go over to China. And keep in mind, this increase was about four, tri four trillion. In other words, eh, about a, call it 25% increase. All right, so we go back to 2019 and let's just call it uh, 200 to make the math easy, and now they're at 304, which would be a 50% increase. So pretty much any way you slice it, as far as the macro government stuff and the arguments for reflation 
here in the United States. They're far worse in China. But yet, for some reason, I think for the average American, it's much easier for them to look at the data in China and say, yes, the probability of a deflationary bust is very, very high. Or for some reason, well, I know the reason, because in the United States, it's very hard for them to come to the same conclusion, although the numbers are very, very similar, because they actually experienced, they felt the price inflation of the last couple of years. It's hit their pocketbook directly. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't factor that into the equation. But when you are trying to assess the probabilities of 2024, seeing more disinflation, inflation, deflation, whatever it is, you've got to try to exclude the emotional component of it. All righty, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. If you want to partake in the webinar, we're doing Rebel Capitals Pro this Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, where I'm going to be talking about my new trading strategy, going more short term, really trying to maybe use options. I set up another $100,000 model portfolio. We're going to describe everything to you on Friday. Also going to be going over some more details from the Argentina trip and talking about the Turkey trip that we're going to be doing in September using only gold, silver, Bitcoin. So if you want to be a part of that webinar, shoot over to georgegamma.com forward slash pro. And we'll see you this Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll see you in the next video.